this evening. Let's begin singing hymn number 505 this evening. Oh, that will be glory. of announcements they're basically the same as usual uh, be in mind though tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock mommy and me will gather here at the church as normal but a week from tomorrow that would be the 20 i think that got that right the 22nd the ladies are and girls are having a fellowship at shawnee states park it's actually not on thursday it's actually on saturday the 22nd at three o'clock p.m that's at picnic area one sign up sheet for that uh uh situation or that that plan to get together there is right back there on the board so if you're interested in going sign up and make sure we know you're coming where we can make sure we're all ready to we we'll greet you there of course sunday morning we'll gather again at nine o'clock for the covid sensitive service 10 o'clock sunday school and of course 10 45 is preaching 6 p.m the evening service you all know about those and uh, of course keeping in mind next week we begin all over again on tuesday prayer time at 8 30 here for the men if you'd like to gather here it's always a good time and you know about the wednesday evening services i don't know of anything else but it's that time again it's the song of the month the song of the month this month is not i but christ not i but christ now we were supposed to get that already once so we're already behind the eight ball so we're going to try it hymn number four in your little booklet if you find it hymn number four not i but christ and I'm going to ask if we can get that played through once for us. And you'll see the words up there, Pastor's doing, but if you would like to play it through once.
Okay. sounds much easier when the person singing it and playing knows how it goes, right? <laughs> now you've heard it and you're experts yourself, so join right in. Okay, we're going to sing all three verses of this new beautiful hymn, okay? All together. None I but Christ be honored, loved, and stay exalted. Not I but Christ be seen, be known, be heard. Not I but Christ in every look and action. Keep your booklets open to page five. We'll sing that one after he's done preaching. Thank you. All right, good evening. Good to see each one of you here tonight, and I hope that you are well. Uh, this evening we're going to do things a little bit differently, and, and we may continue this for a short time as we've been working through our church's statement of faith. I realize that it can be pretty heavy going. And uh, if I feel like it's heavy going to preach it, then I'm imagining it's, you know, pretty heavy going to listen to it. And then this evening especially, we are on point number 10. And uh, I'm sure you all know what point number 10 is in our statement of faith because you all have it memorized. <laughs> it's, uh, the subject is the personality of Satan. And I have to admit, I thought, you know what, that's just not a subject I want to preach on for a long time. So we're going to look at this just for a while this evening. And it is an important subject to understand what we believe or the Bible teaches us about who Satan is. But we're going to look at it just for a short time. We're going to sing another hymn. And then I want to share more of a devotional thought from Genesis chapter 4. Uh, but if I can ask you to open to begin with to Revelation chapter 20, Revelation chapter 20, we're going to note four things about the, the Bible's teaching on who Satan is. And we, it's important to know this for, for a number of reasons, but we want to have an overview of the biblical revelation of the person of Satan so that we can know how to engage him in, in battle, as it were. You know, if we don't know uh, the, the enemy, it's hard to defend ourselves against temptation. 
And so we're going to be in Revelation 20, and I'm just going to read uh, verse 1 and 2 to begin with. It says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Let's just end our reading there for the moment, uh, and then we'll pray before we continue. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the realities it opens up to us. Uh, And Lord, we know that there is a battle that goes on in the spiritual realm that uh, manifests itself in in the world that we can see and then touch and experience. We pray, Father, you would give us an understanding of your word, Lord, not to have a Uh, an interest that goes beyond the bounds of revelation, but Lord, an awareness. So like Paul, we'll be able to say that we're not ignorant of uh, Satan's devices. Help us, Father, I pray this evening in Jesus' name. Amen. So our statement of faith reads, we believe that Satan is a personal being, that he sinned through pride, thereby becoming the author of sin and the cause of the fall of man, that he is the open and declared enemy of God and man, and that he shall be eternally punished in the lake of fire. Uh, So I said we're going to note four things about him, and this evening we want to consider, first of all, the personality of Satan. We believe that Satan is a personal being. He is a reality. He's not just a, you know, it's not just a general spirit of evil that's being talked about. There is a very real person that is Satan. And, and I love how in Revelation 20 verse 2, it's like you have this summing up of all of the, you know, many of the names of Satan. It describes him as that old, you know, the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan. It kind of leaves you in no doubt as to who is being referenced here. But he is a real person, uh, not human as we are, but a spirit. Uh, he was created and we'll see more about that in a moment. But uh, let's go back to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2 for a moment. Ephesians 2 verse 2. There it says, Wherein in time past ye walked according to the cause of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. It is that spirit is referring there to Satan um, in Ephesians chapter 6, if we go over a couple of pages there in verse 12, he says, We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There is this very real truth about who Satan is and that he has an agenda, that there is something that he's working out in this world, something that he wants to accomplish. He was a created being in the Garden of Eden. And if we go back to uh, Ezekiel 28 for a moment, uh, Ezekiel 28 begins by talking about the king of Tyre, but then it goes on to describe what could only be um, Satan. Uh, Ezekiel 28 and verse 12. And we'll read down as far as verse 14, I believe. It says, Son of man. That's one of the ways that Ezekiel is referred to, the primary way Ezekiel is referred to. He says, Son of man, take up a lamentation upon the king of Tyrus and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord God, thou sealest up the sum, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. But now we begin to see a blend and we see that there's a description here that cannot speak of any earthly king. He says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering. The sardis, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, and the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, and the emerald, the carbuncle, and gold, the workmanship of thy tablets and of thy pipes, was prepared in thee in the day that thou wast created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. And when you get to verse 16, you see how, you know, why Satan rebelled, what his motivation was. It says, By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Uh, The description there in verse 17 is of the pride of Satan, and we'll see more in uh, Isaiah if we have time this evening. But he's a spirit, and spirits we can't see or touch or kind of interact with in any way, but the personality of Satan is real. Now, if we go over to Job 38, and we'll look at verses 4 through 7, we see many aspects of personhood. Uh, Job, you know, I think it's meant to be Job chapter 3, so I'll start there. I've got 38 written down, but I'm pretty sure it's chapter 3. 
and verse Well, oh, that's not right either. Let's go to Job 1. That's my last, my last effort. <laughs> Job 1 and verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that fears God and escheweth evil? And then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? And so the, the conversation continues. But again, when you think of personality, when you think of personhood, you know, what do you see there in Satan? He, he interacts with God. He speaks with God. He has intelligence. God says to him, you know, have you considered my servant Job? Have you thought about him, learned of him, and, and considered what he's like? And, you know, Satan here shows ambition. He wants to try and show Job up. He wants to try and ultimately go against, jo uh, say, uh, go, go against God by showing him that Job isn't who he thinks he is. And so there's ambition there to overthrow God and to overthrow Job. So Satan, we begin by realizing he is a person. It's reality. And if we try to ignore Satan, you know, there's a quip that's often made that one of Satan's greatest successes was convincing the world that he doesn't exist. And, you know, if you don't believe an enemy exists, you're not going to be ready to do battle against him, to resist him when temptation comes. Well, think for a moment of the pride of Satan, the pride of Satan. This is that in our statement of faith, we believe that he sinned through pride, thereby becoming the author of sin and the cause of the fall of man. Satan was the first one to sin. Satan is a created being. Uh, make sure you stay away from the idea that Satan and Jesus are kind of equal opposites, that it's kind of that, you know, Far East idea of yin and yang. It's not that at all. You know, Satan is going to be easily, has been defeated by Jesus Christ on the cross. But he's too proud to understand uh, or to accept that he has been defeated. In Isaiah 14, I kind of alluded to this a moment ago. Isaiah 14 and verse 12. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in my heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And they that see thee shall look narrowly, narrowly upon thee. You know, note all of the I wills that Satan does there. It's, it's instructive of his pride. He says, I will be lifted up. I will sit on the mount of the congregation. I will ascend. I will be, ultimately, he says, like the most high. And that pride, again, we need to be aware of it because it's the same pride that wells up within us. Every time we say, well, I know what God says, but I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to go my own way. That's pride. And again, we need to see the consequences of it for Satan in that he was judged. He will be judged. It makes it clear here in verse 16 of oh, verse 15. Sorry. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. When we see what the, uh, you know, the, the art, what the enemy of God did, it should instruct us. And we need to beware that pride because it's amazing how it creeps in. And it's so easy for it just to kind of weave its way in. And we live in a world that kind of manifests, you know, uh, some kind of pride as a virtue. And, and sometimes it's hard to tell what's pride and what's not, but we need to be discerning. We need to be aware. Uh, I know uh, when I had an interview to work at Chick-fil-A a few years ago, a couple of years ago, you know, they asked me that question, why should you get this job and nobody else? And I understand why they asked that question, but at the end of the day, what's that doing? You know, if you're not careful, it's kind of saying, why are you better than someone else? Why should you and someone else not get this job? And I was able to kind of avoid the question a little bit, and I just kind of looked across at the lady interviewing me, and I said, well, I've got an English accent, you know, and so, you know, and she laughed. She was like, yeah, yeah, good point. You know? <laughs> 
But, you know, that's the kind of conversation that, if you're not careful, you know, leads you to stumble and, and fall to pride. Uh, and so we need to be aware of it. This is what brought Satan down, and we need to guard it in our own hearts. Well, what is the position of Satan? How has he positioned himself? Well, in our statement of faith, it says that we believe he is the open and declared enemy of God and man. It's amazing today how there is a, a massive surge of people who are following after uh, Satan worship. And, and there are teachings which are completely opposite to what the Bible says, but it's catching a lot of young people. And we need to be clear in what we believe that he is real, that he is dangerous, and that he's the declared enemy of God and of man. He is the, the physical, or not the physical, he's a spirit, but he's the embodiment of misery loves company. Uh, Satan wanted to overthrow God, and Satan wants to pervert everything that God has made. From the very beginning, when God, Satan went to Adam and Eve and, and said, Yea, has God said, cast in doubt upon the word of God, and you know, cast in doubt upon what God had revealed. And he's in opposition, not just to God, but in opposition to us. In 1 Peter 5, verse 8, he, uh, Peter tells us that Satan, our adversary, our adversary, one who's against us, it describes him as being like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. And my pastor brought out something once, which, you know, I've, I've never really looked into in too much you know, detail, but it makes sense. He says, you know, Satan can't actually do anything to the child of God. Satan can't hurt Christians. Now, we may be tempted by our flesh and by the influence of sin around us, uh, and, and we do need to take Satan seriously, but he can't do us any real harm, and there's nothing that can happen to us without the, uh, the, uh, the, the permission of God. But my pastor would say, you know, if you look at a lion when it's stalking its prey, it's quiet, it's hidden. It's sneaky and devious because it knows as soon as it lets out a roar, its prey is going to take off running. And so, you know, Satan goes around and he roars and he wants us to be afraid, uh, but we don't need to fear. Satan has positioned himself against us, but God has given us the tools in order to resist him. And I want us to just look for a moment in James chapter 4 and verse 7. Uh, he's a, a reality that we need to take seriously but we ought not to be fearful. You know, Satan has a millennia of experience. He has great intelligence, and we can't overcome him in our own strength. But in James chapter 4 and verse 7, this is what it tells us. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. You double-minded, be afflicted and, and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. It is a, a simplification of it, but there is a reality in that when uh, you know, we're, we're opposed and we're engaged in this spiritual battle, when there is a temptation to do wrong, that the, the, the twofold plan that we have here is we humble ourselves and we draw near to God. And we resist the devil, and he will flee from us. But it's because we're in the presence of our Heavenly Father. It's our Heavenly Father who defends us and strengthens us and, and enables us. You know, it's like a, a little child who's all brave and bold because he knows that his dad's behind him. You know, but if for a moment he loses sight of his dad, he, he realizes how weak and frail he is and how much he needs that, you know, that, that support of his dad or his mom or whoever it is, a big brother, big sister who's there to protect them. We can resist the devil when we have the presence of God, when we humble ourselves. And in that place of humility, you know, it's impossible for Satan to get, you know, a root of bitterness or pride into us. Satan is powerful, but he's limited and he's put himself in opposition to us, but by the grace of God, we can resist and overcome him. And then let's uh, go over to John chapter 16 and 11, verse a moment, and think about the punishment of Satan. In John 16, 11, Jesus has given the disciples final instructions before he's betrayed and goes to the cross. And Jesus is describing the ministry of the Holy Spirit and in verse 11, he says that the, the 
when he has come, the, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, he says he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment there in verse 8. And in verse 11, he says he will reprove or convince the world of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. Now, we read a moment ago about in, in Ephesians 2 where it talked about the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. The prince of this world who for time has, has free reign in this world to do as he pleases. But Jesus said here that, you know what? The prince of this world is judged. Satan is considered crushed. When Jesus, dies, Jesus Christ died on the cross, the enemy was defeated. Now, the, the final consequences of that are playing out across the age in which we're in. And that's where we come back to the verse that we read at the outset there of Revelation chapter 20 uh, and verse 2, where it said that uh, he laid hold, that uh, an angel came down from heaven. It says he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. This is a future period when Satan is bound for a set period of time. He's released one more time at the end of that thousand years. And finally, he's cast into the lake of fire and he is forever put away from the, the presence of anyone else. Satan was defeated at the cross by Jesus and is judged. And we need to be clear that those who follow him will find the same uh, consequence, the same fate. So this evening, we just look briefly at those uh, four things. We uh, consider the person of Satan, that he's real, the pride of Satan, uh, which caused him to be cast down, the position of Satan in opposition to us, but the punishment of Satan is sure. And in Romans chapter 6, uh, we have it spelled out very clearly for us that we have to make a choice whether we will yield ourselves onto sin, which leads to destruction, or to righteousness. And that's a choice we have to make. And the first choice is, begins with salvation. Have we trusted the Lord to forgive us of the sins that we have committed, or are we still yet in our sins? But then as believers, we need to make that choice regularly. Am I going to yield myself to sin or to righteousness? And the two paths are very, very clear. Uh, let's go ahead and move on to our third hymn this evening. We're going to turn back to the word just briefly um, in a moment. Uh, but the hymn is one that we learned a little while ago, My Hope is Jesus. And so that should be in your books as well. Brother Dan, do you have the number for us? Yes, sir. Number, five. number five. And so we'll sing this together and then uh, I will come back to the word.